by Martin Birch. Ah. Who, of course, produced some number of other stuff. But, but yeah, and he also, produced Deep Purple. That was a big deal. He produced Deep Purple. He produced Rainbows, uh, Rainbow Rising, and Long Live mm-hmm. Rock and Roll. He produced White Snakes, some of the White Snake stuff. Yep. He was a he was a big name in, in producing name producer. time. So, and of course, the artwork was by. Um, it was still Derek Riggs at this point, wasn't yes, it? it was still Derek Riggs. So, Where, I'm looking for his little symbol. It's got to be it's on there somewhere. somewhere. It always is. Is it right? Is it right oh, there? Oh, look! It's a scrotal tattoo that this guy has right down here. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be on here somewhere. It's just like blue oyster it's cult. Not above the eye, is it right there? No, that's not it. It's like blue oyster cult. You're always looking for the symbol somewhere in the yeah. album, and it's hidden on something. In any case, I have a, actually have an Iron Maiden album, which you can't see sitting over there up there in the corner and it's signed by uh, Derek Riggs. Oh cool. And uh, he signed he signed over top of the Iron it's what album is it up there? It's the first album, Iron Maiden. And he signed over top of the Iron Maiden logo instead of on top of the image. So on top of Eddie's face. Yeah, he, <laughs> so he didn't sign on any part of the artwork. He signed over the Iron Maiden logo. Well I didn't think anything of it. I just it was he, they him and I were falling out. Him and I were talking yes, him and I were just talking and, and uh, he was really funny guy, him and his wife both. And uh, anyhow, the next guy came up and he had his Iron Maiden album signed, and he signed it. And, they, and the guy asked him, why do you always sign on the Iron Maiden logo? And he goes, they always sign on my artwork, I'm going to sign on their logo. Because <laughs> they're cunts, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. All, All right. right. So now I'm the cunt. Oh, I'm the cunt. <laughs> <laughs> All right, where are we? Ah, okay. This is a good one. Number 21. Everybody's favorite disease. Yep, anthrax. Uh, I, Persistence of time. Yep, I got into this one early on. Like I said, 1990 was the year I got out of it for a little while, but I had, did get this one, and I was a huge anthrax fan, as you guys know, if you watch my channel for any amount of time. I mean, they were a local band for me. I bought the first single when it was in the stores, so I followed this band from the beginning. Uh, pretty much continued on. These guys were hugely popular at this time, and they were playing stadiums. Uh, they were on freaking Married with Children, for God's sakes, you know, <laughs> which was a huge show back then. You oh, yeah, it was. I mean, it was the show back then, so. Um, and I got to say that, um, where is it? What song are you looking for? Did they just call it Time? Yes. Oh, there it is, there it is. The thing that blew me away on this album was their Joe Jackson cover, Got, got the Time. time. Yep. One of the best cover songs ever. What a great choice, and man, they just, they nailed it. It's such a great version of that song. And then, but there's still tracks on here that they play to this day, Keeping the Family, yeah. uh, In My World, Belly of the Beast, and of course Got the Time, but yeah, it's a, it's a great album. This is the one right after State of Euphoria, right? Uh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Well, I mean, they, and they had all kinds of other singles and yeah, EPs the, and all that kind of junk that came out, but yeah. Yeah, they released Time of the Man like seven times or something. <laughs> Well, it was first released as a, just a B-side track. It was. It was and the then, B-side to I Am The Law. Right, and people just loved it so much. They, you know, I, the, I loved it. I did too. I thought, I thought it was, it was great. great. And there was a second B-side on there that you don't hear as much. It was called um, Buddy Love, Love Bomb, Bomb and the Satan's, Satan's Lounge Band. Band. <laughs> that one didn't quite catch on. <laughs> that was pretty funny, though. <laughs> it was. That's what people, I, I, to this day, I hear people... I posted a single, this the 45, for um, that rap song. And people were all bagging on, saying that sucked. That's why Anthrax sucks. I'm that like, didn't suck. That was hilarious. You're like, and I was like, it was a joke song. Yeah, but they made it serious. I'm like, no, it no, was they a didn't. Joke. <laughs> the whole thing was a joke, and it was a, and it was funny, and it was fun. And nobody was doing that crap at that point. Nobody, nobody yeah. was really doing that crossover there stuff. There was that that weird little rap metal band that I can't remember what they're called, but they were they were horrible. But anyhow, I don't remember them. I remember Body Count. No, yeah, Body Count was they were, after the fact. They were but, pretty intense. Yeah, but yeah. Whatever. And then, a little side story on this one. I th- this one's been re-released, and there's like a three disc, three LP version of it. I, I bought it from Amazon when it came out new. It came to me it's so beat up. It was like every corner was like it wasn't just a little band. It was like way oh, back. Blows. So I'm like, that sucks. And all the, all the plastics are cut. So I I took a plastic off and I played and listened to the whole thing. Packaged it back up, sent it back to them. So then they sent me another one. Came in the same condition. I was like, they sent it in an envelope. With no cardboard in it. <laughs> it was was it a private seller on Amazon? No, it was Amazon. That so doesn't like, make any sense. That was ridiculous. So I returned it a second time, and the third time they sent it to me again. This time they sent it to me, and it was obviously a used copy that someone else had returned. I was like, I just, I'm like, you know, what? I'm done. I want my money back. I did so. I, so I still have my original pressing, and I'm done. So what was the extra? <laughs> what was on the extra vinyl? Uh, demos and B sides and oh, all that kind of stuff. That's cool. Live um, tracks. And, can we get that AC on? I'm getting hot. It's on. 
It is on? I'm warm. I never have my hair down, except for you guys. <laughs> um, all right, I gotta do another goofy one. This was a big album for me. It was a strange album for me, but it was a big one. Uh, 1990 was the year that Jane's Addiction put out their third full length, which is called Ritual de lo Habitual. Uh, I was still in DT Seizure when this came out, and here's the thing. DT Seizure, all four of us, were big fans of the previous album, Nothing Shocking. Remember the one with the, the two girls that were joined at the shoulder, yep. naked, topless, in the rocking chair, their heads on fire? What a great album. Fantastic album. Um, I won't say I love this one just as much, but it came out during a time that there was a lot of change going on in 1990. I, I, for me personally, and also I just think in general, it was a, it was a pivotal year for some reason. Definitely in music, uh, and in the world too, really. So what we got on here is a, uh, let me show you this one, controversial cover. This is an art project by Perry Farrell, the singer. Um, three-dimensional art project, you know, paper mache and a bunch of all crap in it and stuff. And it shows him and two girls looking like they're in bed doing uh, the old menage a trois. Legend has it, it lasted for three days and this was the art project that he created out of it. There's a song on the album called Three Days that apparently is about this. Uh, union, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> <laughs> art project. Um, it comes out swinging, really. The song Stop, great song. They were a treble. What's that? They were a treble. A treble? Treble. Not a couple, but a treble. Oh, a treble. So I thought you said triple. Or triple. Or that. Um, I think it's a great album. Ben Caught Stealing was a huge hit. Um, it's got that funky bass line, da -da -da -da, and the bar bog dogs barking. And I don't know, Perry Farrell was a really interesting dude. Um, I think if he had died after this album, he would be a friggin' legend, like Jim Morrison kind of legend, but he didn't. But he was definitely a very unstable cat during this, this period of time. Drugs and all that, nervous breakdowns. And, um, so this, Jane's was a very interesting band to me. Um, hit me kind of hard. And I remember I saw them on this tour too, with my sister, uh, here at ASU. It was one of the first shows I went to here when I got to Arizona. Not here, I'm in New Mexico. Um, yeah, Jane's Addiction, third album, Ritual de lo Habitual. I definitely recommend Nothing Shocking, their second one. Uh, this is a very close second as far as my favorites. What's next? Damn it, I gotta do it again. <laughs> again, I apologize. Um, I didn't look this one up, and I forgot to bring it. So, this he one... Did. What's that? He did. I did forget. Yep because this is, this is just albums that I don't have in my collection. Wow, there's no Wikipedia? Oh, there it is. Okay, this came out 1990. This was a big hit for this band. Um, and I always thought it was kind of the beginning of the whole unplugged trend that stuck around for years in the 90s. And it was one of my favorite trends in music over the past 20, 30 years. Uh, Tesla, five-man acoustical jam, live album, but all on acoustic instruments, yep. not their typical... I mean, nothing nothing to say against that particular album, but that trend was awful. There's a lot of stuff that came out of it that I loved. Um, there's a lot of stuff that came out of it that sucked. Yes. But there's some albums that came out that were absolutely phenomenal. I like the Kiss on the MTV Unmasked. The Kiss Unplugged. Un unplugged. Unplugged. Yeah, it was <laughs> it was it was better than what anybody expected, I think. And it was the beginning of that whole reunion Union. thing yep. too. So I, when I saw the, I saw the video disc of that, whatever, it's like a. What they called them? DDD, thank you. Um, back when it came out, my buddy Chris played it for me. I was like, wow. And then they played Going Blind. Yeah. I was like, that's great. Anyway, talking about Tesla. Yeah. <laughs> Big hit off this for them. With a cover song. Was a cover song by the Five Man Electrical Band. Yep. Which they nabbed the title and changed it to Five Man Acoustical Jam. Uh, the song was Signs. Um, huge hit for them. I really enjoyed this album a lot. Uh, it came at a time when I just kind of needed something that was a bit more mainstream and kind of normal and a little bit laid back. Organic? Yeah. And it just hit the spot. And um, they did a lot of their hits off of Mechanical Resonance, the first album. 
couple things off of the second great radio controversy of which Heaven's Trail No Way Out was a huge song for me. Loved it. Um, I thought it was a solid release. Uh, definitely a good follow-up to the first two albums, which I really, really liked a lot. So that, uh, yeah, Tesla. That's all I get to say about that one, I guess. I, I, love, I really like Tesla's uh, cover album that they did with all the cover songs on it. Yeah, there was some stuff, cool there was stuff on it. It was called like Real 2 Real or something Real, Real, like that. yeah. Real, Real 1 and Real, Real 2. Yeah. It was weird, too, because Real, Real 1, you bought it in the stores, and, and you get the, the Digi Wallet thing, and there was a spot for another CD, but the CD wasn't in there. The only way you could get the CD was to go to the show on that tour and go to the table, and they would give it to you. Oh, I didn't realize that. So I purposely made sure I went, went to go to that show on that tour, because I'm getting that, that missing getting CD. that freaking CD. And I did. <laughs> All right, uh -oh. next up. All right, we are at number what? 18. Number 18, second album Halfway from... through. Second album from Seattle's Sanctuary, of course, World Dane. Um, this was their last album, sort of. Um, sort of. It was the last album for last album Sanctuary. Sanctuary. They broke. They ended up becoming Nevermore. So basically, a big bass player um, uh, Jim Shepard, and then their touring guitarist for this album was. Um, He's I'm, not on there. I'm working on his solo album over here. And I can't, oh, Jeff. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Jeff Loomis. Loomis. <laughs> Just brain farted that one. Uh, so they're touring out guitar player. So Jeff, Jeff Loomis, Jim Shepard, and Worldane decided to form Nevermore. Why, okay. did, why did they decide to form Nevermore and not do Sanctuary anymore? From what I understand and what I've read and some insider information I got from record companies was they wanted Sanctuary to go, this is a band from Seattle, on a major label. The major label wanted them to do grunge. Oh, they, they wanted Sanctuary to do grunge? grunge. They wanted oh. them to go into a grunge direction because that was what was selling at the time. But that... I mean, what a, so that what a been massive been. shift of styles that would have been. Yep. I mean, they were pretty they dark. They were a metal band. They were a metal band, but then they were dark. But, man, I can't imagine them doing that. So they, they A lot of bands did, though. They did, yeah. But so they, they were like, nope, we ain't doing it. So they broke the band up, formed a new band called Nevermore, and then continued playing the, the style of music they wanted to play. Put out, what, eight albums, with, nine albums with Nevermore, and uh, then then Sanctuary reformed and put out one other album oh, three they years did. ago. Yep. I didn't realize that. Another great album, although it sounds more like Nevermore than Sanctuary to me, but still, it's just a great album. Um, but yeah, this is, a lot of people consider this a, a progressive U.S. power metal classic. I, I do as well. They also released a live album at this time. It was a promo-only thing on CD, um, which I also have. It's... Um, was called uh, Into the Mirror Black Live, so it was very, very well thought out title. <laughs> kind of an afterthought. <laughs> and, uh, and, and this guy on the cover? What do you want to call it? I, I swear this guy just started showing up on every single album cover. Like, isn't that the same guy that was, like, was on Megadeth's uh, Countdown to Extinction? Yeah, his hair and, was a little longer, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then it was the same guy that was on the Fate's Warning album that where he was laying back in the bed and... <laughs> I, I, don't I think th you're right. <laughs> I, I don't think it actually is the same guy, but it's, I don't know what it was about old gray-haired men that was suddenly getting on all these different covers. It's fine. I mean, he looks a little bit like the guy from Phantasm too. Yeah, and I, I love this album. So it's it's a it's a classic. So um, it doesn't quite have the same high-pitched vocal style that the first one had. There's still some of that, but not quite like Battle Angels on the first album. Yeah. There you go. All right, man. Sanctuary, one Sanctuary. of my all-time favorite bands, one of my all-time favorite albums right there. All right, don't get too comfortable. How that didn't make it into our top ten, I don't know. Uh, Actually, I do know, because I wasn't into it that year. Well, and also, our top ten was pretty solid. Yeah. We were pretty... It didn't take us long to come up with it, and there just wasn't room for anything else. What number are we on? Uh, we are on number 17. All right, number 17. This was one that I discovered from their first album. This is their second album. Um, it was released in the U.S. on REX. It was released in um, Europe on... No. Great Road Racer. Road Runner. One of those two races. Road Racer, Road Runner. One of the road company. guys. Yeah, so anyhow, this I don't have this one on vinyl. It is the only Believer album I don't have on vinyl. It annoys me. But <laughs> Not familiar it, with it. It's This is just raw, brutal, thrash metal. I mean, if you know Thrash, you know this band. Uh, they toured on this album. They toured with Bolt Thrower and Sacrifice from Canada. Um, you can definitely tell after this that those bands played a part in their albums coming out afterward because they started getting more and more progressive and more and more weird. Okay. Uh, but they did get a little weird on this one, too. They did a U2 cover on their first album. Uh, I'm assuming they did a... Uh, which song? They, did a, they didn't do a U2 cover on the first album. They did a classical-sounding thing on their first album. 
Desiree's or something like that. Oh, Desiree. Yeah. I just played that on the show a few And then weeks on ago. this album, they did a U2 cover of Like a Song. So, um... Oh, cool. I didn't know that. But yeah, it's, it's just brilliant, technical thrash metal. And I love the production. I love everything about it. It's... It's raw, it's heavy, it's thrash, and if it's you know the, me, I... It's on the old Rex label. Yeah, on the R.E.X. label in the United States. But anyhow, I mean, I, I've done a, a bazillion favorite thrash album videos over the time, so I'm sure you've seen me show that album more than once. Literally, it's the only one I don't have on vinyl, and I would love to get it on vinyl. Awesome. You're up. All right. Yeah, this album was special for me. 1990 saw the... We were in the thick of the Tony Martin era for Black Sabbath. And of course, Tony Iommi at the helm, as ever. This, I can't say I really, I, I was huge into Sabbath in 1990, but the classic Sabbath. Not that I, not coming down in any of the other eras, but Ozzy Sabbath and me were heavily, heavily in a monogamous relationship. <laughs> you know, we were fucking all the time. And um, this, my buddy Joey Nash turned me on to. And I probably wouldn't have paid attention to it otherwise, because at the time I was like, eh, I don't need it. It's it's not the Sabbath that I love best. So I just gave it a shot. I was open-minded one day. He goes, check this out. It's really good. And it is. It's friggin' awesome. It's my favorite. I since have gotten into all the Tony Martin era albums, but this one still stands out as my favorite. And the the opening tracks, uh, Anno Mundi and the Sabbath, uh, sorry, Anno Mundi and the Lawmaker are just they hooked me immediately and I just loved it. And I was like, wow, I love a Sabbath album that's outside of all my currently known eras. This is great. Great album. I still think it's really strong. I agree. I think it's one of the one of the best uh, Tony Martin eras. And I, yep. I think Tony Martin's a great singer. He is. I don't quite understand why he felt he needed the lyrics to be so dark. I think it's almost like he was trying too hard. Yeah. It's like he had Ozzy, and I, I don't think... I would say, yeah, Geezer's lyrics were dark, but not in the way that we've come to know dark. Right. You they, know what I mean? Yeah. They were like just out there. And you're like, what the hell? But then Dio and came along. The Dio came along. But again, Dio's lyrics weren't really that dark. They were just like rhyming. And yeah. They, he was very, very medieval and poetic and all but, that But stuff. a lot of the songs, if you read them, you're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and then, then, of course, Ian Gillen came along. And most of his lyrics were like, duh? What the hell? <laughs> I've never been that into Ian as a lyricist. Yeah. Because a lot of times he just borrows old Little Richard lyrics and sings them and stuff like that. But I think Tony was just like really trying to make his mark in Sabbath. I don't know. But yeah, great singer. I mean, oh, fantastic. Yeah. With, who else was in the band? That Was Cozzy Powell in the band still at that Yeah, Cozzy Powell was on drums, Neil Murray on bass from yeah. White Snake, uh, and Jeff Nichols on keyboards, of course. It was a really solid lineup. It just wasn't necessarily, it wasn't the Black Sabbath that I knew and loved. But well, most people knew and loved, which is why it just didn't click. Right. Any other band under a different name, it might not have caught on at all. But because Tony basically was Black Sabbath at this point, I think excellent, excellent album. So if of all the Sabbath albums, minus the, Dio, the early Dio and the Ozzy stuff, would that be your favorite of all of those? Well, I love Born Again, too. Yeah, so I really, really love Born Again, but... As far as the Tony Martin era, absolutely my favorite. Yeah. Followed closely by Headless Cross, probably. Yeah. I think I'd probably pick Board Again as well, but I really like the Black Sabbath album that was the Tony Martin solo album with uh, um, Glenn Hughes on vocals. I think that's... Um, oh, oh, you mean the Iomi Fused stuff? No, the, uh, no, Shining's... Uh, oh, 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 Seven Star. Seven Star, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Shining Star. <laughs> we just did Striper. I know, Striper. <laughs> <laughs> or as it was known... Previously, with Jeff Fenholtz's version, was Star of India. Yeah. All this stuff was redone when Glenn Hughes came in. But, yeah, uh, yeah definitely. Outside of... Uh, it was supposed to be a solo album, and it just didn't yeah. happen. For, well, I guess it was a label, right? That... But, well, it, I think it was the label that pressured him to put it out as Black Sabbath. Sabbath. Yes, yeah, I meant. Yeah. I, finally, I finally read what I think is the definitive account of that whole Sabbath Fenholt bullshit. Mess. It was Don Arden. It was Don Arden. Don yeah. Arden's the one that he was telling Tony one thing, telling Jeff Van Holt the other. They were both telling the truth. It was Don Arden was lying to both of them basically, and then just a mess. But I finally read an account. It was in the Never Say Die book. That was all about those those off years, and I was like, that makes sense finally, which I thought was cool. Anyway, totally 
totally got off topic. We can talk about Sabbath forever. <laughs> we could. It is. <laughs> and if this is what I think yeah, it is next, and I've got a lot to say about this one. <laughs> this was one of my favorite albums that came out this year. Um, I had been really wanting to check these guys out for a few years, but I just wasn't really finding their stuff. And then at this point, I found a bunch of their albums. St. Vitus V, brand new album in 1990, originally on Hellhound Records. And I really... This album just hit the spot for me. I loved it. It's still one of my favorite Vitus albums. Um, of the Wino years, this is probably my absolute favorite. Look how young Wino looks in that picture, man. That's I know, amazing. really young. All of them were, really. Yep. And, uh, but this, this was the last album he sang on before he left and pursued his Obsessed and all the other bands he did. And then he returned several years later. Um, I love this album. There's not a song on it I don't like. But I will say my favorites are absolutely uh, track number two, I, be I Believe Black. Just <laughs> devastating song. And When Emotion Dies, which features guitarist Dave Chandler on vocals. It's one of those situations where he can't, It's he's not singing on key, but it sounds so good. Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. And the whole album is just really, it's really great. It's very simplistic doom metal, but it just works really, really well. Um, if you haven't heard Vitus, and as far as from the Wino era, it's I would definitely say definitely check this one out. Very slow. I call I call it traditional doom. Yeah. It's not like there's a lot of epic doom bands like Candle Mass, those kind of things. It's yeah, it's not, not like that at all. It's not like that. It's it's more traditional doom, so it's in the line of like Pentagram. And early Black Sabbath. Or early Sabbath, yeah. The early stuff. Place of Skulls. Yeah. And uh, there's a, there's some songs on here. There's a couple that are so slow that they hurt. <laughs> like Patra Petra is very very slow and it's like oh my god this is so slow I, I, it, it aches it makes me ache it's so slow but there's a there's a video on uh, on YouTube somewhere of Don Dockin talking about when he was working with the band producing them it's freaking hilarious and that and you can tell that Don Dockin produced that next album it was uh, Children of Doom album it was the one after this one I think you can tell it's like oh man. Yeah, it's, it's brighter. And, Much. And he, and, he, and he kept pushing the band. You guys need to write an upbeat song, a faster song. And he's like, he's like, and they're, they're, they're coming at me with all these... Duh, duh. And, and, I, he goes, and they come back, we got it, we got it, we got it. Duh, <laughs> duh. <laughs> How those two ended up together, no clue. I never would have put those two together. Nope. No but it's interesting to hear. Yeah, it's, it's not it's a bad album at all. No, it isn't. And it's got um, uh, former Count Raven vocalist on it, uh, Christian... Uh, yeah, I'm not going to be able to remember it Christian either. something. Uh, and it's really, it's a different album for, for Vitus. It's a unique album for Vitus, for yeah. sure. Uh, Wino returned uh, shortly after. And actually, Scott Rieger's returned, too. Several times, yeah. Everybody comes back. St. Vitus V, 1990. Awesome album. Check it out if you haven't heard it. Where are we? Oh, like, this is all you. We're professionals now. We, we have a phone with a list on it, so we don't just <laughs> forget them. Ah, this, yes. This is the mainly album. you. Third album from Bay Area Band. A bunch of uh, relatives, cousins. Saw this band just recently. It was Testament and Death Angel and uh, Exodus on the Bay Area Strikes Back Tour. They were fantastic. Awesome. Uh, I just uh, I saw them three or four years ago uh, in Phoenix. They were, they, I they saw were great. Them three or four years ago, too, and they, they were great. They were great. Yep. So I, I love this album. Now a lot of people don't like it as much as the first two. It's not as raw. It's not. As, it's not every song is, you know, speed for speed sake. Um, but they were growing. They were growing. They had. They were getting into songs. I don't necessarily like the direction they took after this when they became the organization so much. But I liked the, when they came back and became uh, Death Angel again. But anyhow, there's not a bad song on here. But yeah, Room with a View was the ballad. Um, and that was the single that then that was the video on MTV at the time and people just didn't dig it because I mean this is a thrash band that they're playing a, a, a ballad but gosh man I mean Testament had a ballad Jews Priest had great ballads I mean yeah <laughs> I, I just don't understand the, the why a, a band can't step outside of the, the norm and do something different but I think when you're when being in a band is your livelihood your bread and butter and you're on the professional level, major label. Yeah. You make some decisions sometimes that maybe you shouldn't have. Maybe. And yeah. But anyhow, I don't know. I love this album. The Old Deception, one of my favorite songs on here. 
uh, falling asleep, I believe. I can't read it. Look at that. That's horrible text. Yeah, I can't. It's, plus, it's red. It's, <laughs> it's hard red, to see. yeah. So, it doesn't matter. It's just a great album. If you like th if you like the Bay Area thrash scene, most people now, it's funny, now Now I see people who tend to love the album. It's a lot of albums like that. Remember remember when uh, Another Perfect Day by Motorhead came out? Everybody hated that album. Oh, I but it's so it. good. I loved it, but I, then again, I was a big Thing Lizzy fan, so it was like, yeah, so it's, and it's, I was a big Motorhead fan, so it was a perfect mashup for me. Yeah. But a lot of people hated it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, people were booing him when they were on stage. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, Brian Robertson was an odd choice. Musically, I think it worked. Uh, the image, visually, not so much. Well, and it would have worked if he still had his Thin Lizzy look. Yeah, because he, I don't know what he was doing. He was experimenting with some kind of weird Olivia Newton-John kind of look. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. The, the, the short shorts and the and the weird hair and the, and the, the headband and the curly perm and yeah. I don't know. But whatever the case. All right, number twenty something. No, we're at thirteen now. Thirteen. Yeah, Dang, and this is. Good. Very uh, innovative band here. Um, just coming off a little experimental trip that they took in into hair metal, <laughs> which I thought was awesome. Cold Lake. <laughs> wow. If you saw uh, what, what year Cold Lake came out, '88, I think, something like that. So if you saw our '88 video, I believe we, we heralded that one quite a bit. Oh yeah. I mean, I like the early Celtic. Company. When I saw that come on MTV, it was uh, Cherry Orchards. Yep. I saw the video. I'm going, wait, 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 wait. This is the. This is the guys that put out Morbid Tales that was so friggin' dark back in 84. I'm like, what is this? I tell you what, though. Celtic Frost put it, did better hair metal than any hair metal band ever. That's what I, and that's what I always tell people. If that's what hair metal was, I would have loved more of it. I mean, it was just so good. It was... Yeah. I mean, it had I, just, I liked it by default. It's like that's the best hair metal I've ever heard. If that's yeah. the case, anyhow, that, but that's not, this album they were attempting to return to their sound. Yes. Um, they brought back one member, I believe, and kept two others from the Cold Lake days. Um, but I mean, Tom and Martin were pretty much the mainstays. Yeah. But in any case, I mean, I love the first track, the heart beneath, and it's just like this jackhammer of a sound. Yeah. I just absolutely love it. Tom um, Warrior, just a real, and I don't know what name he goes by anymore, Tom Gabriel, Tom Warrior, Tom Fisher, um, just a real, a fount, the fountainhead of um, metal creativity, I think. I, I agree, and I, I, I know people don't dig this album quite as much as they do the earlier stuff, but this is one of my favorites as They're well. They're very so. unique. I mean, they, they really inspired a lot of the black metal that started coming out. And, uh, and this pressing is really weird. Good, you can keep talking. Yeah. Um, Except I forgot what I was going to say. But <laughs> there is a, they did change the cover a little bit on here. I don't remember the, the original release having that CF on there. No, I think all the in, the uh, reissues had that. Yeah. The, the, the cover's basically the same, I think. Yeah, the broken glass. But this thing, this it's a first of all, it's a a double album in a gate. This only recently. That's a recent reissue, isn't it? Yes. Hang on to this, or quick. And I think they were they were trying to be a bit more intellectual on this one, like. Okay. They were trying to re they were trying to prove themselves after people hated the uh, right the turn they took. But yeah, oh, it's gotta... I remember what I was going to say. Tom's creativity has sometimes taken this band into really strange areas. Hair metal not being the strangest, actually. There's there's some stuff that's never really seen the light of day. That's Demos cool. that that he actually started venturing into hip hop and weird. One in my hand single. Oh, I never seen that before. Uh, I would love to own that. I've never. I've Very never seen different it. artwork for them. Yeah, uh, but anyhow, I mean this this packaging on this thing is amazing. It's a it's a double album. It's got bonus tracks on it. Um, was Heroes Heroes was uh, on here, right? Yeah, Heroes. Yeah, the Bowie cover. Yeah. Um, and then also, oh, hang on this for a second, or you can put the record inside the middle. Is it in the middle? Yeah. Is it a double or a triple? It's a double. What's in here? I'm telling you, this thing is packed full of stuff. I've got all kinds of crap in here. <laughs> this is the book that came with it. It's it's amazing. I mean, this is a lyric book. It's like a giant CD booklet. Yeah. So, but yeah, Kurt, was it Curtis Bryant? Was that his name? Uh, this dude over here. I don't remember. Uh, Martin. Yeah, Dane. there you go. It was it was Curtis Victor Bryant, guitars and vocals. He he, he was a, a leftover from the. Um, oh, and then Stephen Priestley. Priestley. He's been around for a while. He, but he was also a leftover from the Cold Lake days. Yeah. So, anyhow. There's a picture of the band if I didn't already show it. I just think a very innovative band that I keep returning to because their creativity is inspiring to me, even if sometimes it doesn't quite translate. It's a cool, cool photo of the band, too. Yep. 
He's wearing a possessed shirt. <laughs> That's not the shirt he was wearing on the Cold Lake video. Yeah, another cool one. Yep. Anyhow, awesome package this one is. Great I... band. They always put out consistently good product, I think. And, uh, you know, since Martin Ain died several years ago, uh, Kelton Frost will probably never see the light of day again. But uh, Tom went on to do Trypticon, which is actually some really intense, weird, like black doom metal kind of a, kind of a thing, which I really like. In, in some moments, it's like a bit more than I my tastes uh, allow for. But it's very moody for me. I've got to be extremely moody. I've got to be in the right headspace to listen to it. Like in the middle of winter is a good time to listen to it. Yeah, even without snow. What's next? Oh yes. We're still doing a video, aren't we? We're professionals, don't you know? Oh yeah. Oh good, I get to do one of the lame ones again. Alright, but a great album in my opinion. Uh, this was a band that I got into in 91 and I had to go retro with them because I got into their third album was Primus. One of the best things that came out of the 90s in my estimation. Um, Frizzle Fry was the, basically at this point, was their second album. Um, very unique. Primus had a very unique sound. I, when I first heard them, I heard Rush, I heard King Crimson, I heard The Residents, and a big mishmash, uh, along with like some tongue-in-cheek funny comedy, a very unique sound, thanks to Les Claypool's bizarro bass playing. And as I said before, Larry Lalonde, fresh out of Possessed, now in Primus, playing nothing like he played in Possessed. <laughs> and just a drummer uh, powerhouse by the name of, uh, shoot, Herb. Herb, Herb something. Tim Herb Alexander, great drummer, real tight, very uh, tasty drummer. This whole album, Great tracks. Um, it's Primus standards, really. And, and I, I've never was a huge fan of Primus, but we had a bass player in Ultimatum that was a Primus fanatic. Yeah. So every time we went on to do long distance, I, I heard them a million times over. So, and then what was the band Victor Wooten was in? Um, bass player that, anyhow, he was constantly playing Victor Wooten stuff too. Oh, I'll never forget he was the name. a jazz guy. I, yeah. I, um, I wanted to say Weather Report, but that was uh, Jacob Pastorius. Um, I don't remember, Daniel. but yeah, I know what you're talking about. But uh, I mean.